My name is Jenny Anchondo, and I am here as your host and moderator today uh, just to kind of take you through the process and make sure that you get the most of this session. That is always my goal each and every week, just to make sure that you are able to really pull away some important nuggets. So last week, it was part one of this discussion. However, even if you weren't here for last week, you'll still be able to get a lot out of today. We have two distinct topics, both of them from Nancy Alvarez, who is a supervisor in the business development program for the Small Business Administration. So what is this? What are we covering? Last week, we did the SBA programs and services, how to start, grow, expand. This time, we are talking about growing your small business with federal contracting opportunities. Yes, opportunities potentially for you and your business or even you and your future business. I tell you what, after you hear from her, you might just get a new idea about something you want to venture into. So I'll give you a little bit of a background on our speaker today, just so you know where she's coming from. And since she's been doing this in the Dallas-Fort Worth office since 2011, However, I will tell you, even if you're not uh, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, which she and I happen to be from, you, th this is really going to speak to people all over the country. So don't worry if you don't happen to be in Texas, if you don't happen to be in Dallas-Fort Worth. She covers a 72-county region. Uh, she does this in both English and in Spanish. She's really a champion for women and disadvantaged businesses in the federal marketplace, playing an important role in increasing the participation of small businesses in federal contracting programs. So I love it when you have somebody where you know that their passion is something that you can benefit from. And that's exactly what we're experiencing today. She graduated from Jacksonville University with her bachelor's in business administration. She is a member of countless advisories, honor societies, boards. She's not somebody who just goes to work, clocks in, clocks out and goes about her day. <laughs> She's truly somebody that's sort of immersing her in her profession, uh, advisory board specifically with the Dallas-Fort Worth Federal Agency Small Business Advocacy Council. Um, it's a business professionals forum where federal agencies share, gather, and create ideas to help promote small businesses' interest and participation in the federal marketplace. I highlight that one specifically because I just think it pertains really to what we're going to be talking about today and growing your small business and getting a hold of those federal contracting opportunities. So I know that if you're on here, you're probably excited about it, I will tell you that if you missed last week's session, it is already out on the YouTube channel. So you can bookmark that and uh, you know check in on that later today once we hop off this call. I think that these calls are, are great to listen to and re-listen to. So if you don't catch everything today, don't worry, this call will be up on YouTube by, uh, by this time next week. Usually get them up by Wednesday, so the day before, so you can kind of prep for the next session. All right, I could go on and on about Nancy. She's phenomenal, you guys, but I'm going to mute myself. And what I'll do is I'll be over here taking notes. I am working as a participant along with you. I'm trying to be your eyes and ears. But if you have any questions that come up, anything that specifically pertains to you, your situation, your business, then this is your chance type a message in the chat, ask a question, and then on the back end of this discussion, we'll get the last 10, 15, 20 minutes or so to do Q&A, and I'll ask Nancy all of your questions. All right, Nancy, I promised I would mute myself and then I kept talking, so I'm really gonna do it this time, and you go ahead and take it away. All right, thank you, Jenny. Let me set up here my presentation, uh, and hopefully everything's going well and you can see it projected. Yes, there. we can see it. Looks great. Very I see, I see good. The US Small Business Administration. Very good. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We're really excited about the second part of this, and this is going to be a subject that is dear to my heart. I really enjoy doing government contracting, and I've been doing it for a long time. Um, so today we're going to be talking about growing your business through federal contracting opportunities. So let me start first by talking about what we do, the SBA. We are one of the smallest federal agencies in the government, but we have a huge responsibility, a huge mission, and that is to help small businesses in America start, grow, expand, and recover. So our programs are gonna fall under one of these subjects, main subjects, start, grow, expand, and recover, uh, if you're an entrepreneur and starting your business, we have uh, funding opportunities, we have uh, counseling. Uh, if you want to go overseas, international trade, we do that as well. And then lastly, if you have to recover from a nationally declared disaster, 
we're there to help you with low interest loans and we usually give you two years deferment so i would encourage you to take a look at our website www.sba.gov uh, just like jenny said we are uh, a federal agency so we're located in all territories u.s uh, states and territories so it uh, doesn't matter where you are if you go to our website enter your zip code you'll be able to get access to the closest SBA near you now we can't do it all alone so we have a lot of resource partners certainly with a lot of expertise and so uh, I would advise you to take a look at them they're free counseling the SBA pays for that so I would encourage you to it doesn't matter what area even if you don't know what you want to do and you want somebody to brainstorm we have counselors to help you do that all right so a little brief introduction here to today's subject right most importantly we want to consider why is it why should we do business with the federal government well i just don't want to give you the the details right we're going to highlight a couple of things but i'm going to show you why okay and i think that's the most important things because you want to see it with your own eyes right you want to see that this is palpable that it's doable that it's something you can do so some of the reasons um, why people do business with the federal government is to uh, boost their revenues. Uh, they also want to enhance their reputation. The more work you do for the government, you are evaluated on each contract. And the better your performance, the, the more contracting opportunities are going to come your way. Because this system is across the board. Every contracting officer in the federal government will check out your they're called CPARs it's an evaluation system every contract you perform for the federal government as a prime contractor you're rated and everyone has access to them not only that but once contracting officers know you they know your work they talk you know they have conferences where they get together and they discuss things like this upcoming projects and potential contractors uh, that are able to do the job so again building a reputation is key to success because we'll jump to the next one right which is it will give you access to new markets new opportunities you know you just don't have access to the federal government once you build your reputation as a federal contractor you can certainly do business with any business out there large small medium whatever it is even at the state level so again the opportunities will start coming you'll you'll continue to expand um, stability and predictability certainly um, we know that the government isn't going anywhere right we print our own money <laughs> so we're not going to run out of money you'll have um, you'll have stability in terms of the revenues that are coming in from those projects uh, and predictability because the government sets up these contracts that are long term and we're going to discuss that a little bit more on length um, also innovation and technology adoption so this gives you an opportunity to do that as well and it benefits you because uh, you can get additional clients so let's go a little deeper into that let's look at the increase in revenues one of the things that I always share with small businesses is you want to diversify your revenue stream right you want a little bit of your revenues to come from one area, um, a little more from another area. It's like when you're investing, right? You don't put all your eggs in one basket. Um, you diversify your, your retirement, your, in, your investment. Well, it's the same thing with revenue diversification. You wanna do maybe a little bit of uh, work for the federal government, a little bit of work for corporate America, some in the private sector and that way it helps you better uh, um, weather the economic downturns of the economy so i always i always believe that this is the best strategy again um you know i've been with the sba for a long time i've been with this program so many years and i've seen some of the companies that rely on one source of revenue stream they go under when the economy uh, takes a peak so again these are good strategies they're not easy to implement they could take time but certainly is a doable strategy 
Um, predictable payments, again, the government works under regulations, right, laws. Um, there is a provision out there under the Prompt Payment Act that requires the federal government to pay small businesses at a reasonable amount of time, and I believe that is 15 days. However, most of the contractors that I work with, uh, they've been doing this for a while, so they tell me that they get paid within a week. Now, when you first start in government contracting, this might be a little challenging because the government has rules as far as how you bill them and you have to follow those rules. So I would encourage anyone getting into federal contracting to take advantage of all the resources that we have uh, that will provide you the technical support, the know-how, how to manage a contract, how to, how to build the government so that it doesn't take long to get paid by the federal government. And then again, the last one, long-term commitment is that most of the government's contract, or not most, there are mo many uh, contracts that are in a re recurrent basis, meaning uh, they don't expire per se. I'll give you an example. Um, so janitorial services, we always need somebody to clean our buildings. Um, so those are contracts that are done are they're perpetual in terms of the needs. However, the government breaks them down into sometimes five-year or 10-year terms so that everybody has an opportunity to bid on those contracts. Um, so for those contracts, usually what the government puts out is what's called a base and four options. This means that this is a potential five-year contract. And so potentially because those options are there for the government to exercise them. That means that they can decide not to, uh, not to exercise that option. However, I'm gonna tell you that mostly 95% of the time they do exercise those options and you end up, if you were awarded a base and four options, you're gonna be working on that project for five years. So again, there are many different types of contracts and we're gonna highlight some of the key important things that I want you to learn because they're gonna save you a lot of time in the long run. Improve reputation, again, credibility. This is gonna boost your, your credibility out there with other companies, with larger companies that might be interested in doing business with you. Um, contracting is not only at the federal level. In the private sector, we call this supplier diversity. And supplier diversity programs do exactly the same thing. They are committed to uh, securing some of their purchases through small businesses or businesses that are certified as a minority business. We're gonna talk about what the federal does here, but I would encourage you to look at some of those programs as well, because again, that's gonna continue to help you diversify your, your product and, and services. Um, or, I'm sorry, your revenue stream. Uh, trust and confidence, you know, clients, certainly they're gonna see your records, those that are prime contractors to the federal government that might want to do subcontracting work with you or for you, will look at the CPARs, will look at your evaluation. That gives you, again, another revenue stream because you're doing work now for another prime contractor. This could be as a subcontractor. However, again, you continue to build your expertise, you continue to build your network, and you continue to diversify your revenue stream. And lastly, networking opportunities. In the federal government, we continuously do outreach events. Every agency has their own events. Um, we call them industry days in some areas, expos or in the private sector, what we call them. Uh, but the government calls them industry day. And those industry days are designed specifically to go out there and search for small businesses. Now you're gonna say, well, why, why does the government have this interest in, in diversifying uh, or increasing their opportunities for small business? Well, think about this. Small businesses make up 
of the U.S. economy. So the contribution to small business from small businesses to the economy is significant. So the government wants to maintain this engine running, right? So you guys are the motor that keeps this you know, economy going. And so it's in the government's interest to ensure that small businesses get the opportunity that they deserve so that they can continue to uh, participate and and contribute to the U.S. economy. Um, uh, improve reputation, again, uh, credibility boost. I mean, this is going to boost your, your credibility. Uh, trust and confidence. And again, networking opportunities. Let's move on to our next one. Um, here's another benefit in, in advance or enhance innovation. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're talking about here that you will have opportunities to do business with, with the government where, for example, the government might say, I have a need for this. I have a need for this product, but there isn't anything out there in the commercial market. As small businesses, small businesses have great opportunities to create these these innovative ideas to provide to the federal government. Not only that, and then you can implement those technologies out of the federal government as long as there are no um, national security issues with that contract. But again, it will give you a cutting edge in technology, primarily if you are a small business uh, that likes to do research and development, which by the way, there are grants to help you with research and development, and that's for the very same reason. The government is looking for a product, a service out there that will save them money or that will save uh, the environment. And so you might want to take a look at what's called the SBIR, the Small Business Innovative Research or the Small Business Technology Transfer uh, Research those two are grants specifically for uh, uh, research and development. So great programs, you can get up to $750,000 for your project. Um, again, that goes with research and development. And lastly, cross-section learning. And this is so important. Sometimes when you're out there working with the federal government, you get to do something a little bit different and a little bit different because if the government likes how you work and they're comfortable with you and they know that you can take on some additional challenges, they will give you additional areas or additional work in other areas that you can learn and use that learning uh, to, again, continue to build other clients. So the opportunities are great. But you know what? This is all, you know, based on what I have experienced. And like I said, I want you to feel this, right? We can't move forward without understanding the landscape, right? You wouldn't go uh, to an island in the Caribbean if you don't know uh, that it doesn't have um, water, it doesn't have all the services that you're going to need, right? You are going to figure out first, it, would this be a good vacation island? So it's the same thing for the federal government. You want to venture into this landscape and you want to know, you want to have a feel for what it looks like. What are the opportunities for me? Would I be able to make it here? And all those answers can be found. Um, we're going to start first by talking about a great tool that you can use as a small business, and that is our federal procurement contracting programs, small business set aside. So one thing are the certifications, the other is the set aside, and we'll dive into that. But the main procurement goals, statutory procurement goals, meaning that's the law, is that 23% must be reserved for small businesses. 12%, and then I just got the numbers today, went up 13% now for small disadvantaged businesses or 8As. There is a 5% for women-owned small businesses, a 5% for service disabled, veteran-owned small business, and a 3% for historically underutilized enterprise zone. Wonderful programs. They're all wonderful programs. I can tell you that I primarily have experience with the 8A because 
that's what I manage here in the office. I manage over 80 firms that are in the 8A program. And the goal of the program is to provide you business development and contracting opportunities to help you grow your business and be competitive in the federal marketplace, okay? So again, we can you can learn more about our certification programs, the benefits, the eligibility criteria, the process for applying. Uh, we have a workshop every first Wednesday of every month from 10 to 12, where we go into each one of the certifications and we talk about the eligibility and we talk about the process for applying. So I encourage you all to visit that after we um, after we finish the presentation. If you're interested, uh, visit our website, our local website, DFW, uh, and you will see the listing of upcoming webinars in our calendar and you just register and they're all free. Now, looking at this landscape, I'm not gonna go deep into these numbers because what I want you to see here is that what this graphic represents is funding, right? Contracting opportunities over the past 10 years. And there's a trend here and it's very obvious through this broken red line. So you see that there's an upward trend, okay? There's an increase, and the increase is right there highlighted. Contracts are up to small businesses by $50 billion. That's a B, billion dollars. $50 billion in the last 10 years. And if you notice, each one of the lines represents each one of those certifications that I talked about earlier. 8A, small disadvantaged business, women owned hub zone. All these lines represent, the, the top one represents small businesses. Anyone that is a small business can do business with the federal government. All they need to do is look at what their industry considers to be a small, small business and you self certify yourself and you can start bidding as soon as you register in what's called the system for ward management. The next line is the small disadvantaged business. That's the one that went up. It was first 5%, last year was 12, this year is 13, and by 2025, it will be 15%. So again, the opportunities are not going away. Um, and the other ones are the women-owned, small disadvantaged, uh, service-disabled veteran-owned small business in the hub zone. And so you can see that although they have a, a smaller uptrend, they're still trending upward. So the opportunities are there. But again, let's continue to, to see what the data says. This is on the other side. Look at this and see that there's a downward trend. This is the number of small businesses participating in federal contracting, meaning small businesses that have been there, but what is the trend? There's a decline in the number of companies doing business with the federal government. And they estimated that by the end of this year, there will be a decline of up to 50%. So that means 50% of the small businesses playing in the small business arena are out. So what does that represent for a small business? It represents your ability to be able to take advantage of this. For the government, it's bad news, but for a small business, it's a great opportunity. It tells you that there are opportunities because there are a lot of small businesses moving out. Now I'm gonna talk about the potential why, okay? Here's another one, and this is new entry. And new entry, meaning new small businesses into federal contracting, has decreased by 60%. So the government is placing emphasis on creating programs. And I tell you what, I've been with the SBA for about 24, 25 years. And the last two, three years, I've seen the most funding go to training small businesses in doing business with the federal government. 
the amount of opportunities because we're just not reserving the opportunities we're not working hard to get those opportunities reserved for small businesses we're also providing you the tools the resources so that you can be successful in federal contracting you don't know how to submit a proposal that's okay we have a resource to help you get there we have the resources to, to train you. Right now, the SBA has hired four or five different contractors with expertise in this area. And that grant funding that they receive is so that they could train small businesses in doing business with the federal government. So again, an enormous amount of money going in. And that leads me to this next picture. And I want you to take a look at it because I think small businesses have to recognize an opportunity when they see one, okay? Because guess what? Look really quickly here. Whoops, you saw that? It flew by, it flew by. So you wanna make sure that when you spot an opportunity, you're able to take it. You're able to recognize that there's a need there and not only a need, but an opportunity. And not only that, the positive side of this is that you are significantly contributing to the U.S. economy. So let's move on to our next slide and let's talk about uh, our contracting programs and how they work, right? Federal contracting programs and small business set-aside. There's a difference between small business set-aside programs and supplier diversity. Primarily, the difference stems from the fact that in the federal government, we've conducted uh, disparity studies to support that certain individuals have been underrepresented in federal contracting. And so that allows us to do statutory uh, goals meaning reservation of contracting opportunity for those individuals that have been underrepresented in federal contracting. Now, in supplier diversity, these companies do not have that supplier, or they, they have a supplier diversity, they just don't have the law that will allow them to do a direct set aside for a small business, meaning no one else can compete. That's what the federal government does. So usually when you do supplier diversity, you are participating in what's called a subcontracting plan, where the goal is really imposed on the prime contractor. And usually you're never the prime contractor because you're not large enough, for example, uh, companies to, uh, to take the risk and do business and do a set aside. OK, so what you might want to do is participate in supplier diversity, gain some experience as a subcontractor. Right. And then you can either move into federal contracting or you can start in federal contracting. We have very similar programs to help you build your capacity. And we'll talk a little bit about those. Uh, let's move on to our next slide. One very important thing that I want you to understand where the benefits of these programs come in is by looking at the slides. There are different types and sources of set aside contracts, right? There are some contracts that are competitive, meaning they are uh, when multiple small businesses can perform the work um, or provide a product. These are specifically reserved for small businesses, and usually these purchases are below $150,000, okay? The contracting officer, the federal agency knows that anything below 150 has to be reserved for competition between small businesses. Now, you wanna take advantage of that because that's good, right? You're not gonna be competing with large businesses. However, if you participate in some of the other programs, then you get what's called sole source opportunity. And sole source opportunities are contracts that you can market yourself directly to the agency and the agency awards it to you on a non-competitive basis. That is such a great benefit. It's so good of a benefit that most of the companies that participate in 8A program, they love the ability for them to go out, market themselves to a federal agency, and get that contract awarded without having to compete it. 
the program is so good that we impose what's called business activity targets, where we make sure that small businesses that are participating in the 8A program can wean themselves off these 8A sole source opportunities because guess what's going to happen when year nine comes around and they no longer participate in the program? They would go bankrupt if they're not to, you know, they haven't diversified their, their uh, revenues. So excellent. And then you have the last way the government buys goods and services is through full and open competition. You don't want to go there. <laughs> That's the large businesses, okay? We all know what happens with the large and medium-sized businesses that are competing for federal work. It is too competitive. And they usually end up killing the small business because we just can't compete. We don't have the, the resources. We don't have the manpower and economies of scale. So you want to stay away from the full and open competition unless you participate in what's called the hub zone program. One of the other ones I highlighted earlier. The hub zone program has what's called a price preference. That means that you, when you go full and open and the agency sees that you are hub zone, they will automatically tag on 10% to the lowest bid if it's not a small business. That means that you as a small business could end up being the awardee of that contract even though you are competing with a large business. So again, it's, it's, it's an exciting program. Um, the criteria is not based on, you know, you have to be a 51% uh, owner of the company, uh, and that owner has to be a U.S. citizen. The company has to be small. And lastly, because this program is intended to revitalize areas that are historically underutilized, meaning um, high unemployment rate, low income individuals, we, that's the reason why we incentivize companies to relocate to these areas and hire these employees. So that's how this program works. And it, again, it's, it's a great program. Um, we're trying to do more with the, a, uh, with the Hub Zone program. Um, and let's talk a little bit about how all this works, right? How does it all work, Nancy? Well, going back to those statutory goals, remember we talked about that? Jenny highlighted that I participate in what's called in the Federal Small Business Advisory Council. That is a council of just federal agencies, small business specialists that are looking for small businesses and are looking for more ways to better connect with small businesses. So again, we're not connecting just with local buying agencies. We're also connecting with agencies outside the state of Texas. So it's a great way for us to network and again, a great way for us to be advocates for small businesses. Uh, let's see. The eligibility criteria again, I could go into details in this and it's going to take too long. What I encourage you to do is attend one of our two-hour workshops where we go through all the benefits the eligibility criteria and how to apply for this program the first Wednesday of every month. Kevin is a facilitator. He's an excellent uh, expert in the different federal contracting programs. You're able to ask him questions and you're able to schedule appointment with him or with myself regarding any of this program. But take advantage of that. Jot down any questions you might have. And then again, we'll be more than happy to meet with you and answer any questions you might have. Um, the next thing that I would encourage you as a small business is to do a market research, right? We see that the opportunities are there, but we have to identify whether or not the government buys what we have to offer, right? There is no need for you to get certified first and then find out that there is no work for you in the federal government. And I hate to say that because oftentimes I've been, run, I've been wrong about what the federal government buys or doesn't buy. Um, I've assumed many times that the government doesn't buy something and I've been proven wrong. So you know what? I now say the government buys a little bit of everything. The best way to get around this is to use our free tools. 
we have access to the data and it's free of charge. You can register for those websites. Uh, one of them is the Federal Procurement Database System. You can Google that and it'll give you the, the, uh, the site. That'll give you uh, historical data from the federal government, what they bought, who's bought it, and what quantities and how long they've been buying that. Okay, so that gives you a better perspective on the market size and the share that you can carve out if you participate in one of our programs. Um, also, once you understand who is your potential client, look at their websites, look at their mission and vision, because you are going to tailor your marketing approach to help the agency meet their mission. Okay, so you're going to develop a capability statement. A capability statement is very similar to a resume. You want to take that resume and you want to carve it in a way to help the agency understand how you can help them reach their mission. And guess what? In that capability statement, if you have, if you're holding any of those certifications, I want you to list them there. Because if you list them there, they know that they're going to be able to claim credit. Okay, remember the statues? Uh, they're going to be able to claim credit for awarding to a small business or whatever certification you have. So that is important. Lastly, you want to build relationships. Our job in here revolves around creating networking opportunity and connections for small businesses. So we partner with different federal agencies, with local entities, um, you name it, and we participate in uh, events with intent to help small business and, and outreach and market to small business to come and attend these, these uh, expos or industry days. Because again, it's the agency's effort as well as SBA's interest in increasing federal contracting opportunities for small businesses. So again, it's a great way for you to uh, market to the federal government. The good thing is that, you know, after the pandemic, a lot of the agencies went uh, virtual. And so some of these industry days are still being, uh, you know, broadcast virtually. So this is a great opportunity for you to build from the comfort of your own home or office, uh, not have to travel to Washington, D.C. like it was before the pandemic. If you needed to do business with the federal government and the office was located in Washington, you'd have to travel directly to Washington to be able to market directly to the agencies. And so let's play the game. Who's ready to play? And if you're ready to play, you know, you can collect. You can get on that board and collect. Um, one final thing that I want to highlight before we take questions is one important thing. SBA is well known for our program. It used to be called Emerging Leaders. Um, it's now called Thrive, Emerging Leaders Reimaged. And this program is designed for uh, executives. Uh, and it takes you through an eight month training course with the intent for you to develop a marketing plan to scale your business and hire employees. Remember, I told you that our opportunities are made available to small businesses because you are the engine that keeps the economy running. So we've created this program, and this program costs the SBA about ten dollars to $15,000 per participant. And we only take up about 20. I'm highlighting it because the application period just started. It just opened on February 15. Okay, so there is some criteria there. Your annual revenue should be uh, between 250,000 up to 10. Uh, let's see, up to yeah, up to 10 million. Um, your biz, you must be in business at least for three years and at least have one employee other than yourself. Okay, again, the goal is to help you grow your business, hire employees. So we're going to help you develop that plan. We're going to give you the tools. We're going to give you the experts. And once a month for four hours, you will attend this workshop. You will develop a relationship with your peers and you will work on separate projects with your peers. But primarily, you'll spend four hours in class 
for eight months. So I encourage you again, you could take a snapshot uh, of the uh, QR code and that will take you directly to the uh, website to register for that program and it is at no cost to you. So before I take questions, I'm gonna ask you one last thing. Please let us know how we're doing. Let me know where I can improve or let me know what other topic we might be able to bring to help you get to where you wanna go. So click on the link or again, uh, take a picture of the OCR that will take you to the website and it's gonna ask you about three or four questions. Um, again, take the opportunity to uh, give us some feedback, good or bad. Uh, the idea is right to continue to get better in what we do and provide you what you need. So lastly, I wanted to let you know that we are on most social media platforms. I have uh, an account, I manage SBA's account also in LinkedIn, so please connect with me because this is where I promote programs like this. And you can have access to those programs. We're also on Facebook and we have a YouTube channel with lots of videos and lots of information on some of other SBA programs and services. So Jenny, I'm gonna throw it back to you and we can take on some questions. Amazing. Nancy, thank you so much. You really just have a ton of information. And I'm sure to you, it seems like, okay, this is, you know, just sort of like obvious stuff, but gosh, this is really, really like people are hanging on to your every word because there's some great <laughs> opportunities and you are getting some love in the chat from somebody saying, Nancy, I love your energy. So um, <laughs> hopefully you kind of feel the love from that. Now, when you were talking about those, the set asides, the 10%, can you go over that again with the, what that the 10% means? It, I guess it sounds like it helps the smaller business as compared to the medium or large, how so? Sure, you're talking about the price preference is what you're talking yes. about. So when you participate in the HubZone program and you get um, certified as a HubZone company, the agencies understand that you have relocated or you're working specifically to help the government revitalize an area. So for that, they give you what's called a 10% price preference, among other things. You can also compete with other hub zones. But if you want to compete full and open, then you have that little tool, right, uh, that will help you kind of boost your, your possibilities of landing that contract. And so this is how it works. So if it's full and open, we know that large businesses are going to be bidding. Let's say that a large business uh, submits a bid and they're the lowest because usually uh, their economies of scale allows them to, you know, kind of cut their price, you know, pretty tight. So what happens is let's say you have a small business that is certified hub zone and has that 10% price preference, but the company may be bet, uh, bid $100 and the small business could only bid 90 or 95, right? They're gonna tag on 10% of that, that um, amount bid to that contract. So 10% uh, of 100 is 110. Now his bid is $110 and the hub zone is 95. So who's gonna get it? If it's based on price, certainly it's going to be the hub zone company that's going to be awarded that contract. So that's how that works. So it's not it's not a guarantee, but knowing that most people are price shopping or most entities are price shopping in general, it gives that advantage. And then also, do they actually get paid more or is it just the competitive edge? They do it's actually. Like a, right. It's the competitive edge okay. that they get to because remember, they're competing with a larger company. And the good thing about this is what excites me about these programs is that another small business, if you don't have the capabilities, partner with another small business. The law right there says that a joint venture is permissible when a small business does not have the capabilities to perform on a contract on its own. So you can joint venture with another small business or with three or four other small businesses as long as each one of you are small, okay, to basically bid on a larger contract. Okay. And again, that takes on, that joint venture takes on the capabilities of all the partners. 
that's how the government sees the joint venture. So okay. again, we have great tools. We've implemented tools like Joint Venture Mentor Protege Program, all these tools to help small businesses gain a foothold in the federal marketplace. Okay, that's great information. Super, super helpful. You know, when we when we talk about these, you know, people deciding to compete, and let's say somebody's watching right now, and they're like, you know, I've never delved into this, but I'm thinking about doing it. Um, I think the concern is always like, you know, it's going to take a lot of effort, right? You have to figure out how to do it and how to apply. And then, you know, obviously you, you don't know if you're going to get it or if you're not going to get it. Um, how many groups or businesses are usually going up for each job? Is there like an average? Is, are we talking like five or like 5,000? Well, it depends. So if you go full and open, you're going to have a lot of businesses competing for that contract. If you go into the small business set asides, let's say a small business, you're going to have a larger group of small businesses that are going to compete, but it's not going to be as many uh, competition there as, for example, if you go in full and open where everybody can, can bid on that contract. This one's going to be only small businesses. Then you have the other categories that are even smaller. OK, and you have less people certified in those programs. So, of course, you're only going to be competing, let's say, with if it's a if it's a women owned small business set aside with only women that are certified by the SBA. And you know what? We have access to our our database, which is public. If you're women owned and you want to know how fierce the competition would be as uh, as a women owned small business certified, you can go in there and pull all other businesses that are women owned in your same industry to have an idea what your competition is going to look like. And the, and not all of those would necessarily even be applying. Right, correct. Right. That's just an assumption for you to figure out the potential, you know, the potential for the market. Remember that I mentioned that the problem is that we've seen a decrease in the number of, of small business participating. Some of it had to do with the COVID, but the other aspect of it, it is, it was the red tape. It was all that that you talked about, but we mitigated that. We've implemented, we pump money to training the small businesses. We have right now, one of our contractor will provide you a tool. He will show you how to do a capture management system. And then he also incorporates what's called a bid, no bid. That means that he'll help you figure out, identify the opportunities, and, and do this diagram to determine whether or not you should bid on the contract or not bid on the contract based on many factors. Is it, is it uh, financially feasible for you? Um, will the profits be there if you get awarded? So many, so many different topics for them to really, you know, bypass all the reading that used to uh, entail doing business with the federal government because you know there wasn't the workshops there there wasn't the technical assistance now the technical assistance is there okay good because we, we we don't have time for paperwork nancy we're just trying to earn a living out here yes you know <laughs> we, i get it <laughs> you know, all the applications and stuff i think that's it's great it's great to hear because it can be daunting to kind of start the process yes. you know, from somebody saying you know hey you mentioned a peer who works primarily with disabled owned um vet businesses um, mm -hmm. Do you have contact information for that person or a way to get a hold of them? Yeah, absolutely. We have a, a veterans business representative here locally, uh, and she's also in contact with what's called the Veterans Outreach Business Center. Uh, that organization is funded partially by the SBA, uh, and uh, the person here, the SBA person who's the uh, kind of representative is uh, Bridget Moon. And you could call uh, our main number at 817-684-5500 and ask to be transferred to Bridget Moon. She's our veteran service, uh, veteran representative. Did you say Bridget Moon? Like Sunday? Bridget Moon. Uh-huh. Got it. Great. I just put that in the chat, you guys, um, and I typed out what nancy just said so if you're a person who needs to copy and paste um i put that in this <laughs> sorry i feel like when I, when I type on the computer sometimes i type my notes and it's like bumping the screen around but it was important to get the number down so you've got you've got the number there um now you were talking about you know you can obviously 
collaborate with other businesses so that you will have sort of the wherewithal to actually do the project. Can you, can you bid on your own? We go back to the cleaning example. Let's say I'm somebody who provides housekeeping services and that's what I do professionally. And, and I see a small job and I know that I can handle that by myself. Can you bid it by yourself? Sure, you can. And let's say, depending on the scope of the, the project, right? Let's put it as an example, the janitorial one. Um, let's say it is a building uh, and it has 10 floors. And you know that your staff is limited. You only have probably two, two people, sh uh, person. Um, so what you can do is you can connect with other small business, with another small business. You probably know a lot in your industry and say hey listen i have this opportunity you don't want to disclose with who it is okay i have this opportunity um it's with the government and i was wondering if you would you know partner with me and you could do two, two things you could do it through a joint venture if you have the technical and financial capacity to perform on a contract on your own right if you don't that's when you want to do a joint venture if you do then you just want to do a teaming agreement where you basically sign an agreement with the other small business and say, you're going to do this percentage and I'm going to do this percentage. And so it's, it's kind of a commitment between the two small businesses to perform on the contract. Um, but again, that is not considered a joint venture, meaning a joint venture, the award is made to the joint venture. In a teaming agreement, the award is made to the participant, whoever is submitting the bid is the primary, is a, is, is a prime, okay? And then the prime can have an agreement with someone else, but the government doesn't have anything to do with the teaming partner. Okay, so let's say I was going to be paid $100 to do the job, and just because I'm bad at math, so we're going to do $100 to do the job, but when the other group filled in for me, I paid them $90, and then I kept the $10 just for broking, brokering the agreement, basically? Jenny, you are speaking my language. <laughs> Anytime the government does a small business set aside, they impose what's called limitation of subcontracting. I love that you asked that question because what happens is that depending on your industry, okay, you are required to perform a certain amount of that contract with your own labor force. So I'll give you an example. If you're a general contractor doing construction work, you're required to perform at least 15% of that contract, the cost of the contract with your own staff. Okay. If you are in, if you're providing a, a product, then it's 50% 50, 50%. So again, it depends. Okay. Okay. It depends, but you do, you can't just be like getting government contracts and, and just like not doing any of it, but just sort of. <laughs> Correct, correct. Like the only way, work, but not actually only, doing any of the work. Yes, the only way you can get away from uh, not doing, uh, and, and it's best that you do at least a little portion, is what's called similar situated company. So if I'm a woman owned certified and I bid on a contract, and Jenny, you're a women-owned small business set aside as well, but you didn't bid on it, I could say, hey, Jenny, I'm going to subcontract out a portion of this contract. And guess what? If you and I do it, even if I do 10% and you do 90, okay, I still met the limitation of subcontracting because we're both similarly situated. We're both women-owned small businesses, and it was reserved for women-owned small businesses. Okay, got it. Now, let's say you are awarded a contract and then you realize, oh my goodness, I am in over my head. I actually, I, I bit off more than I can chew. <laughs> are you able to then go forward and add some subcontractors or is it something that you would have needed to say at the outset when you apply? Well, you always want to be prepared. Um, have a contingency plan in place because the government has what they call place of performance and time of performance, right? They'll give you a certain amount of time to complete that contract. So you don't want to try to scramble at that time to try to find someone because you might end up defaulting on that contract. What you might want to do is 
do an agreement with different contractors and say, you know, I'll give you a portion of this contract if you engage with me in a teaming agreement. So when I need you, at least you're going to do the smaller portion. But if the opportunity comes, I might be able to give you more. So you have your contingency plan in place and you can call on the contractor primarily if you have an agreement with them, right, a signed agreement. Um, they're going to come and they are going to bail you out. They're going to help you out. Yes. Okay. That makes sense. Definitely makes sense. Uh, now, also, once you let's let's say you work really hard to to earn one of these contracts, you do well. Once you're sort of in, are you in? Are you more likely to get other contracts if it goes well, or is it like for each one, you're back to like square one? If that no. makes. Sense. At first, I, I am going to tell you the honest truth. At first, it is difficult because they don't know you. And we all know people like to do business with people they know, trust, and like. I mean, <laughs> that's everywhere you go. It's the same thing with the federal government. You know, they're at risk if, you know, it's their name. Uh, it's their reputation of con as contracting officers uh, to make sure that the small business can perform. So, again, this gives you a great opportunity to line yourself up. Once you do a great job, and sometimes you might market to that person several times, you might be making to them, marketing to them for six months, and maybe you might not get anything. But the more you market, they're keeping you on mind. They, they're, they want to give you an opportunity. Maybe when a smaller one comes up, they just want to test you, and they'll give you that. If you do really well, they'll come back. I've seen it happen all the time, all the time. Once they know you perform and that you're a good performer, they get a referral from someone else or another agency calls and I have this project and I don't have, your name's going to come up. Okay. So it's just, it's really just like doing business with, you know, out in the, out in the real world, out in the regular yes. world in yes. terms of credibility and making a name for yourself that the hardest part is that initial push, that initial application. Correct. Is there a certain amount of applications typically that people have to submit or be before they are successful? Um, you know, it depends. It, it varies from person to person. Uh, those that don't have expertise and they don't use the resources that we provide them uh, will spend a good amount of time uh, learning the, you know, learning the ropes. But if you take advantage of the resources we have, and go visit with them. I mean, they don't charge. We're paying for that. Um, let them show you how to bid on contracts. Let them show you how to read the proposals. Let them show you how to bill. And you're going to save yourself so much more time. That's great advice. That's 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 very very good advice. Okay, now be, before we before we go before we part ways here, you give us a lot of information. Bring us back to the first step. If somebody's never done this before, what's the first step to make? Um, you know, if they're like, hey, I want to do this, where do I go again? <laughs> yes, yes. So the first thing is you don't want to waste any time. So you want to do market research. You want to know what the government is buying, where it's buying it for, and what quantities, because if you can't fulfill it or you can't find somebody to help you fulfill it, then you want to move on to something else, right? Um, plus, that'll give you an idea whether or not you might want to participate in the certifications. Once you see the need is there, then you'll look at, okay, are they fulfilling their small business goals? Because if they're not, guess what? I'm going to be marketing my certification to them. I mean, that's not going to be all. I still have to show them that I'm capable, right? But hey, listen, while you're at it, this is how great I am. And in addition to that, you get to fulfill your small business procurement goals. That would be the, the, the first step only because, again, once you determine that it is a market for you, then the rest is just moving in, getting your certifications and going straight to your source. Who's your potential customer? Nancy, you are wonderful. Thank you so much for being so generous with your time. Thank you for your Good energy, good vibes, good information. Uh, really, really appreciate it. So, you guys, if this was interesting to you, but you're like thinking, I think I need to, I need to re-listen, re-watch, have more questions. It will be on Sarah's YouTube channel by Wednesday. So, six days from now, you'll have to hold off six days. It'll, it'll be up there. It'll be available. And if you missed last week's, I highly recommend going back. The replay is already up. 
And I also want to remind you to save the date for the 60th annual conference. A lot of the esteemed speakers that we have during this series are actually going to be there in person. So uh, if you're local, or even if you're not local, come to the Metroplex and join us uh, at the Irving Convention Center Thursday, April 4th from eight to seven. It's gonna be a long jam packed day and we look forward to seeing you there. Also look forward to seeing you here next week, same time, same place.